Hey everyone, welcome to this week's teaching uh, at Compassion Radford, this midweek teaching. What are you doing? You just hanging out? Uh, <laughs> my name is Jordan. Um, I am so blessed to be bringing you guys the teaching this week. I'm really excited for it. Apparently I didn't do a horrible job because they asked me to do it again. So I got that going for me. Um, this week, we are actually going to be reading out of Galatians. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're going to continue Galatians after this. I don't know. Next time I teach again, I might keep moving through it or I might do something else. Um, but I wanted to teach on Galatians 1 this week because I think it has a lot of cool things. Uh, personally, it's probably my favorite epistle, uh, my favorite letter that that Paul ever wrote, and I think he has a lot of good stuff. Some other reasons why I decided to pick to teach on Galatians this week um, is at our best estimate, roughly, um, it was probably, or I should say almost certainly, written before uh, the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15. Uh, this makes it one of, if not the oldest written work that we have in the New Testament. It was probably the first uh, written work that we have for the New Testament, and it was almost certainly the first thing that Paul ever wrote, or the earliest thing that Paul ever wrote, I should say. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Paul is very concerned with establ establishing uh, his credentials throughout Galatians. He really has to let people know who he is, which obviously if he's been around for a while is not really something that he would need to do. Um, and we also have a lot of different uh, you know, textual clues that kind of point us to roughly when this was written. So Galatians was almost certainly written uh, prior to 50 AD. It was probably earlier than that. Some people put it in the 40s, 40 AD, uh, which is really early. That is within, you know, 10 to 20 years of Christ's death, which is super early. Um, and it's a really good book. Paul has a lot of, of, of good things to say in Galatians. So I wanted to start in Galatians 1. There are a couple observations that I think we, we should start with or I should point out before we get into the actual scripture. Uh, I know you're like, you know, this is, <laughs> I'm just listening to Jordan talk now about the Bible, not even reading scripture yet. I'm going to get there, I promise. I'm going to get to the scripture. But there's some things that we should set forth first about Galatians. Um, some really cool, interest, interesting things that, that I wanted to point out. Uh, number one, Galatians has a lot of really, really strong Christology. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that Paul very emphatically states a couple of things, right? He very emphatically states that Christ is Lord. He is Kyrios. Uh, and that means Christ is God, right? Christ is Lord, is Christ is God. So we have Paul very, very early saying very strongly, Jesus Christ is God. He is God. He is Lord. Um, we also have some other things, right? We have some some early beliefs. Uh, Galatians gets into a little bit about how Jesus came to save us from our sins. Uh, it has things about how Jesus died and was resurrected, right? So all of this points to a pretty strong Christology that, that Paul is setting forth here. And Christology just means, you know, study of Christ. Um, Galatians also has a very strong opinion on the true gospel. Uh, it, Paul gets into this a lot. Uh, Galatians is a very apologetic letter or a very condemning letter 
in some senses of the word because Paul is addressing an issue he sees going on in the Galatian churches at the time. Um, and he is very strongly worded in it. I feel like Paul probably mellowed out a little bit with age uh, because we can see if you compare Galatians to some of his later letters, he definitely gets a lot nicer and maybe, you know, uh, chooses his words a little bit more carefully, whereas Galatians is very, very blunt. Uh, and you can definitely get a lot of Paul's personality through it. So just keep that in mind a little bit as we go through. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and start in verse 1. Y'all are probably like, finally, he's finally getting to the scripture. Um, if you want to follow along, I'm reading out of the HCSB translation right now. It's a really good translation. I definitely recommend it to everybody. But I'm going to start in verse 1. So this is Galatians 1.1. 1, 1, and it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. So a couple of things right off the bat. We see that Paul is establishing his credentials. right? Like I said earlier, Paul is probably not very well known at this point. Uh, the vast majority of people probably don't even know who Paul is. They've maybe heard of the story of Paul that we get in Acts, right? That this person was a horrible persecutor of the church, and he has this huge conversion, and now he lives for Christ, right? Most people have probably heard something like that, um, but they definitely wouldn't know about the person Paul. Uh, and they almost assuredly want to know that Paul is an apostle, right? He is one sent. Um, the term apostle throughout the New Testament and especially in early church history means a very specific thing. If you are an apostle, uh, you are someone who has physically seen the risen Christ. So not even just like you saw Jesus during his ministry, you saw him after he had raised from the dead. Um, you were also sent to teach. It was kind of like a rank or an authority within the church. Um, definitely a little bit stronger than a pastor. Uh, so all of the original, or I should say all of the 12 disciples at the time, um, were apostles, right? They were ones sent by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. And so we can see that Paul kind of evokes this rank. He establishes his credentials. He says, hey, I have the authority to speak to you like this. I am an apostle. I've seen the risen Christ. I can say these things. So he says all that in verse 1. Uh, in verse 2, he also adds, and all the brothers who are with me, right? And this is a, this is a good pastoral point I want to hit. Paul is with people as he's writing this. Paul is with people all throughout his ministry. Um, very rarely do we ever see that Paul goes off alone and does something on his own. And this is true for every apostle, every leader in the church that we see. Um, and th this is really a really good point because as these apostles are writing down these things, creating the New Testament, even if they didn't know it at the time, uh, being dictated by the Holy Spirit, they are not doing these things in a vacuum. They know the importance of uh, being checked by people and being encouraged by people. So Paul is not doing this in a vacuum. Faith and theology can't exist in a single self. Or they can, but it, it, it probably won't be very good. We need other people to check us, to encourage us, and to also tell us when we're doing wrong. Uh, that is one of the reasons we have the church, so we can be held in an accountable community. Church isn't just a place for Christians to gather, you know, people who like each other and want to hang out and have a good time. That's all fun and good and fine, but church needs to be a place where Christians hold other Christians accountable. And that's exactly what Paul is doing in this letter. He is holding these churches accountable. He's setting them straight, as uh, we might get into a little bit, either today or sometime in the future. Paul is saying, hey, 
you guys are doing this thing and this is wrong. This is dangerous. Christians do not act in this manner. You need to shape up. And he's really harsh about it. But sometimes we need that. So I'm going to get uh, going here or I'm going to be, you know, way over time with this teaching. Uh, verse 3 says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So again, this is just harkening back to what I said earlier about that really strong Christology. Paul is laying out this faith, right? This The same exact message that we teach today, he is teaching way back when. Um, the, hi, you want to help me? I have a little theologian helper here today. Say hi, Socks. I know. Um, so that's the first, that's a little introduction in Galatians. Uh, and I'm going to read, I'm going to go through the next portion. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to get through all of Galatians 1 today, but I'm, I'm going to go for it. Um, so 6 through 10 of Galatians 1, uh, after Paul establishes his credentials and he says his greetings, he's like, hey, how are you doing? Uh, he's going to go into what this letter is about, right? He's, he's going to essentially state his thesis. Um, and his thesis is concerned with the gospel. So starting again in verse 6, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to change the gospel of Christ. And so, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying that the same thing that certain people today in the church struggles with, that uh, you know, a large portion of Christians, I would say, struggle with are the same things that they're dealing with back then. This is a, a very big danger for Christians today, um, especially today, because we live in a culture that is very uh, subjective oriented, They're very focused on personal interpretations and personal feelings and uh, what you think you should do, right? We have this term, speak your truth. Right, whatever truth is to you, that's what you speak. And this is what Paul is getting at right away, is that people, Christians, do this with Scripture. It is very easy for us to change Scripture into what we want instead of letting Scripture change us into what God wants. We read things into the text that aren't there or that were never originally intended to be said because we want the scripture to read a certain way. We want it to be comfortable to us. We want it to promote our message, not necessarily God's message. And Paul is, Paul is getting right into it. He is striking at the heart of this. He says, there are some among you who are trying to do this, who are trying to lead you astray, who are trying to give you a different gospel than what we had already given you. So we're going to pick it back up again in verse 8. It says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, a curse be on him. And this is really interesting. This is really fascinating. Because we have a lot of current day parallels with what Paul is saying here. Um, for example, uh, Islam teaches that the angel Gabriel visited Muhammad in a cave and told him to recite. Uh, Quran literally means recite or recitations or what was recited. Um, and, and Gabriel told Muhammad to recite these things and uh, that that was the true religion, that that was bringing the world back into relationship with Allah. Um, 
even a more recent example, we have uh, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, or the great prophet of Mormonism, uh, he claimed that he was visited by an angel named Moroni, and that Moroni uh, told him that the true gospel had been corrupted, and so he had to restore the true gospel. Um, and so we have these striking parallels today where Paul is emphatically saying, no, this gospel that you have heard before, that is the only true gospel. And anyone who comes along after this, even if it's us, right? He puts his, his own head on the chopping block here. He says, if I ever preach to you anything other than what you have already been told, it is wrong. It is not true. It is not the gospel. Uh, and another interesting note is Paul is, Paul is referencing the gospel that they got before this letter, right? So we know people are teaching and preaching in these churches and that they have an idea of the gospel. They know what the gospel is enough to the point that they know that Jesus is Lord and King. Uh, Father God sent Jesus and Jesus died for their sins and was resurrected on the third day. They have an understanding of these things prior to this letter being written. Paul isn't explaining the gospel to them for the first time, which I think is really interesting. Uh, verse 10 goes on to say, For I am now trying to win the favor of... I'm sorry, excuse me. For am I now trying to win the favor of people... Or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave to Christ. This is a very easy trap for pastors and teachers to fall into. And it's because we live, in, again, in a very volatile culture today. You know, we have a lot of cancel culture going on. Uh, we have a lot of people with very strong opinions. Uh, social media makes very dangerous opinions very easy to spread very quickly. And so I think it's easier than ever for people who have been put in charge of a church or put in charge of teaching or being a pastor to cave into peer pressure and to modify scripture or modify their sermons to, be, to have less teeth, less bite. Um, and Paul is making a really good point here. He's saying, I'm not, I'm not uh, twisting or changing scripture to please man. I'm not preaching anything other than what God has told me to preach to you. And so a big concern for people who are pastors or teachers or preachers or even, you know, uh, C group leaders is we cannot compromise the integrity of the gospel. Uh, it is so, so important that the same faith that we have, that we, we pass on to other people. If you think about it, the same message that we preach today as Christians in church has been passed on through generation and generation and generation to us from 2,000 years ago. So we have had this message entrusted to us by people through thousands of years. Who are we to change that? Uh, it's, it's really important for us to focus truly on what God wants us to say, no matter how popular or unpopular that'll be for the people around us. Um, and he's really harsh at the very end. He says, if we're still trying to please people, he wouldn't be a slave to Christ. Meaning that if our allegiance is first to pleasing others with our words and trying to sound smart or trying to preach these sermons that we know have no real impact or no real bite, but people will like them because they sound nice, then we're not serving God wholeheartedly. We are not slaves to Christ. Uh, we're slaves to other people. So I think I'm running out of time here. Um, I am going to wrap it up with the word gospel, because we've gone over that a lot, but it's a really important word. Uh, the Greek there is euangelion, or euangelion, 
Um, and it, it literally means good news or the good tidings or the result of good news. Um, what is this good news? It is the news of Jesus. It is his birth, ministry, death, and more important than everything, his resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is tied directly into this word, into this gospel. Because if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then there is no good news. We are changed because we have this gospel, this good news. We are changed because we know what Jesus has done for us. And because Jesus has conquered death, we have hope. Uh, so really, my encouragement to you this week would be to focus on the gospel. And not even this week, just every day for the rest of your life as a Christian. Um, we live because of what Jesus did. And we know what Jesus did because of the gospel. Because of what has been entrusted to us. Because of what Paul had originally told the Galatian churches 2,000 years ago. And because they were good stewards of that message, we get to now enjoy and know God today. So that'll be our teaching for this week. Uh, I hope you guys liked it. If you have any questions, again, you can always reach out to the pastoral staff, comment on the video. We would love to get in contact with you. Um, yeah, we love you guys. I will definitely be praying for the church this week. Uh, God bless you. Have a great week.